As winter approaches, the deadly and destructive conflict in Ukraine continues with no end in sight. Hello, I'm Arnold Nido, and this is The Heat. The United Nations reports more than 6,500 Ukrainian civilians have been killed since the conflict escalated in February. The International Crisis Group says 14,000 Russian-speaking civilians have also been killed since hostilities began in 2014. Meanwhile, Ukraine says Russia has knocked out almost half of Ukraine's energy infrastructure. Millions are in the cold dock. With the onset of winter, there have been calls on Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky to seek a negotiated settlement, but he's rallying Ukrainians to continue the fight. Well, there's much to talk about. Let's get straight to our panel. Viktor Olovich is a lead expert with the Center for Actual Politics, a Moscow-based policy center. Klaus Lares is a European affairs analyst and professor of history and international affairs at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Also with us is Anton Fedyashin. He's a Russian affairs analyst and history professor at American University. And Sergei Kudelia is an associate professor of political science at Baylor University. Thank you, everyone, for being with us. Uh, Sergei Kudelia, let me start with you, and let's look at the latest developments. Uh, according to the Ukrainian government, Russian missiles have disabled half the country's energy system. Ten million people are without power, and as I just said, winter is approaching. Um, what are you hearing from Ukraine? How bad is the situation there? Well, it is really devastating. The strikes over the last several weeks uh, really damaged uh, the energy infrastructure to such an extent where the key energy producers are now saying that they do not have uh, sufficient um, sufficient supplies to continue repairs. Um, so things have not been uh, really too bad for most of the civilians. We've seen rolling block, uh, blackouts in the cities, but they have not been permanent. Uh, so you had blackouts for a few hours, and then energy, electricity supply would be uh, renewed. But given the damage already done, I think uh, things may get worse uh, moving into, into the winter. So hey, there's one other development which has been causing uh, alarm in Ukraine, of course, but also in other parts of the world as well, and that is Russia is accusing Ukraine of shelling the Zaporizhia nuclear plant. Here's the spokesman for the Russian Defense Ministry. Let's listen to what he had to say. The Kiev regime does not stop provocations in order to create a threat of a man-made disaster at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. On November 19th, the artillery of the Ukrainian armed forces fired 11 large-caliber artillery shells on the territory of the nuclear power plant. On the morning of November 20th, Ukrainian troops fired twice at the territory of the nuclear power plant. So, so, hey, that's what the Russian Defense Ministry is saying. But Ukraine says it is Russia, in fact, that is attacking the nuclear plant. Uh, so you have these accusations and counter accusations. And the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is a nuclear watchdog, uh, is warning that both sides are, quote, playing with fire. How big are the risks here? Well, the risks are very significant because we are dealing with the largest nuclear power plant in Europe. But what I, I think needs to be emphasized is that the Russians, in fact, are holding the entire region hostage because they decided to invade and capture uh, this large nuclear power plant, and they refused to let it go. So I think there are plans in the works to transfer the control of their power plants to some international organizations that at least would be able to ensure uh, that uh, this power plant is secure and safe. Viktor Olovich, what are you hearing about what is happening at that nuclear plant? Well, uh, it is obvious that it is the Ukrainian side shelling the plant. Uh, the Zaporozhye nuclear power station is under Russian control. It's controlled by Rosatom, which is the Russian nuclear uh, power energy. Uh, nu nuclear power agency, why would Russia shell a nuclear uh, power plant that is under its own control? It has, has absolutely no interest in doing that. On the contrary, the Ukrainian side has an interest in doing that, uh, 
to raise international attention because the Ukrainian side, for obvious reasons, would like uh, to have the plant and territory around the plant transferred back to Ukraine. So by shelling the plant and raising international concern about it almost on a daily basis, the Ukrainian side seeks to achieve a transfer of the plant either directly to Ukrainian control or to so-called international control, possibly with the participation of uh, the uh, UAEA and various uh, United Nations bodies. But Victor, so that is the goal of the Ukrainian right. side. Uh, the you, you say that's the goal of the Ukrainian side, but the Ukrainians have a right to take control of that nuclear site, don't they? That is a Ukrainian nuclear power plant. That's not the position of uh, uh, the Russian side. Uh, if the Ukrainian side uh, makes maximalist demands, uh, then, the, that, then the military conflict will continue for a long time. Uh, what is happening in Ukraine is definitely a tragedy, and it's a tragedy for uh, the civilian population there uh, and for, for millions of people. Right. But one has to be realistic. Russia is offering negotiations. Russia is offering a diplomatic solution, a diplomatic end to this crisis. Okay, and Victor. if the Ukrainian side is going to make conditions, then that's not a very... Uh, that's not a position that will uh, bring this conflict to an end at any time soon. Right, Victor, as you say, this is a tragedy and Russia wants uh, negotiations. Well, let's talk about that. This conflict has been going on for about eight years right now, and it started when the elected president of Ukraine was overthrown in a coup that was backed by the United States. Uh, over the weekend, there was a security, a Western security conference that took place in Canada. The Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, he addressed that conference via satellite. This is what he had to say. Let's listen. Russia is now looking for a short truce, a respite to regain strength. Someone may call this the war's end, but such a respite will only worsen the situation. Any voiced ideas of our land's concessions or of our sovereignty cannot be called peace. Immoral compromises will lead to new blood. A truly real, long-lasting and honest peace can only be the result of the complete demolition of Russian aggression. So, Victor, that's the Ukrainian position. What is the Russian position? The Russian position is that this conflict can only be resolved through diplomatic means. And if the Ukrainian side refuses to hold serious negotiations with no preconditions, then this military conflict will continue. One has to remember that the Russian army, despite all the setbacks that we have witnessed over the last eight and a half months, it's a formidable fighting force. And uh, Russia, if it, uh, if it decides to do so, can uh, launch new advances uh, against Ukraine in the coming months. Russia has a lot of stamina, and uh, the Russian forces can, uh, can use uh, uh, resources uh, under their control to, to launch new advances in Ukraine. There would be more bloodshed, and the Ukrainian people will suffer more. Uh, is that something that the Ukrainian government wants, or is that something that uh, the United States, uh, the United Kingdom, and the other sponsors of uh, the Ukrainian government want? Uh, time will tell. Yeah, Victor, you but, say you uh, say the best way to resolve yes. this. Victor, you is say to, is to, you say Russia has a lot of power. to negotiate. You say Russia has a lot of power; it can make more advances. But it was just being forced to withdraw from her son, hasn't it? Yeah, actually, it has uh, withdrawn. Uh, Kherson is the fourth mm -hmm. region uh, where Russia has withdrawn. Mm -hmm. It withdrew from the Kiev region, from the Chernigov region, then from the Kharkiv region, then from Kherson. Okay. But how likely is it that Russia will withdraw from Crimea? That is uh, most. That is majority Russian. Okay. How likely is it that Russia will withdraw? from the uh, Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics okay. that are mostly Russian, the parts that are controlled by Russia, Com extremely unlikely. So if the Ukrainian side chooses a maximalist 
position yeah. and refuses to negotiate without preconditions, it is obvious that the conflict will continue for a long time. All right, Victor, and more people uh, will suffer. Right. I want to move on to our other guest right now. Klaus Laris, um, let's look at uh, what's happening in the United States uh, and what the United States has been saying about this. There was a very mixed message from the Pentagon's top chief, top commander, on resolving the conflict. That's the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley. Um, he made a statement in what appears to be a departure from the civilian political leadership in Washington, in which he said, look, there appears to be a window for peace talks right now between these two sides. But then he added a few days later, after there was a bit of an outcry over what he said, he said, what I'm actually saying is that Ukraine is going to be able right now to negotiate from a position of strength. He said, Russia is hurting very badly. But then, of course, we saw that Russia launched those missile attacks, dozens of missiles, on targets, civilian targets, uh, energy targets in Ukraine. So what do you make of what's going on? Well, Russia is hurting badly, but it doesn't mean it is defeated. And of course, Russia is a strong country. It may well go into the offensive again, but we don't know. You know, at the moment, Russia is militarily clearly on the back foot, has just been thrown out of, uh, out of Kherson. The Ukrainians are marching forward. They are still making progress, although very, very slow progress right uh, now. And to ask the Ukrainians to negotiate on that basis, uh, to basically give in to Russian demands, is really asking too much. But merely is a soldier. He knows what is going on on the battlefield. He knows how cruel war is, uh, unlike many civilian leaders. And I think that motivated him to call for negotiations, to end the tragedy in Ukraine, to end the bloodshed. Um, but the civilian leadership believed uh, that uh, Ukraine needs to be supported, that in the end it is the Ukrainians who will decide whether or not to negotiate with the Russians. And the EU, for example, also supports this position. Uh, that means, in, for the time being, unfortunately, the war will continue. Putin also needs to show some reason oh. and to some, uh, some, some negotiating offer which is realistic, because right now the Russians are militarily clearly on the back foot. Uh, Klaus, I'm going to get your opinion on something else, one other uh, significant development. That is, we are seeing growing protests in Europe against the war. In fact, the Financial Times front page had a headline on that today and reported that there are these regular Monday evening protests in the German city of Leipzig, which actually recalls similar protests that were held in Leipzig against the communist regime um, at that time. Uh, we've also seen that the Netherlands has lifted sanctions in part against uh, Russia. What does all of this tell us? Well, it shows us that the economic crisis in Europe is real. The energy crisis, the inflation crisis is real. Is real. People are protesting. They are very disenchanted with the ongoing war in Ukraine. But these Leipzig uh, demonstrations, for example, they are attended by sometimes dozens of people, sometimes a few hundreds of people. These are not hundred thousands of people, mm -hmm. as we saw in 1989, uh, when these demonstrations in the end brought down the East German regime. That is far from the same scale of demonstrations. But it still shows there is dissatisfaction in some part of the population. And actually, it's quite interesting to notice that during these demonstrations, the far right and the far left often uh, combine forces. And both are protesting about the same thing from very different uh, angles of the political spectrum. Regarding the Netherlands, 91, I understand, 91 exceptions uh, were granted by the Dutch government to companies and other organizations uh, regarding accepting uh, Russian oil, for example, or Russian payments. This shows, again, that the uh, crisis is real, but it also shows a certain selfishness of the Dutch government mm. to protect protect its own people. That has nothing to do or very little to do with European solidarity, mm -hmm. uh, as was agreed. So really, altogether, there is a crisis in Europe, but I do not think that the crisis is uh, ending the war in Ukraine or that politicians will be much swayed by these protests. Anton Fedyoshin, what is your view on the status of the conflict right now? Is Russia in a weakened position, hurting bad, as General Mark Milley said? Is it in a a vulnerable, vulnerable position to the point where uh, Russia would be more inclined to get to the negotiating table right now. Well, look, Anand, the Russians have uh, uh, been asking for uh, negotiations uh, consistently. Of course, the Ukrainians understand perfectly well that the Russians uh, will be coming 
to the negotiations from the stronger position. They're occupying Ukrainian territory, not vice versa. Um, the Russians are on the back foot in the sense of having given up uh, 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 territory in four parts but uh, of Ukraine, I mean four regions. But uh, I think it's also important to note that they have given up uh, that territory without losing major uh, battles. And I think that's a very important component here. Uh, in Eastern Europe, where territory is plentiful, there is a long history of trading terrain for time, which it certainly seems to me like the Russians are doing. Does it look good? No. Does it make the Russian army lo uh, look good? Absolutely not. Are there political costs to this? Uh, uh, definitely, negatively uh, speaking, for the Kremlin. Um, but the Russians are keeping their army intact. Uh, the size of its army is growing in eastern Ukraine. So whether these are tactical moves that are aimed to pursue a uh, forward overall strategy, mm. I think, is uh, more likely. Whether the Russians will be able to do anything with it, um, we will see. But um, let me just remind everyone that the Russians are actually making very slow gains in the Donbass uh, region, uh, where they're on the outskirts of Bakhmut. They're moving towards Ugridar very, very slowly. That's in the southern part of the Donbass. And uh, the Ukrainians are finding it increasingly hard to slow them down and are sustaining massive losses. So this is still a war of attrition. And uh, when you put the two countries on the balance scale, unfortunately for the Ukrainians, the Russians have more fat to burn up. And Anton, what's behind the Russian strategy of targeting Ukrainian civilian infrastructure, particularly the energy plants in Ukraine? Right. So, listen, uh, what's going on in Ukraine is a tragedy for the Ukrainian people. That goes without saying. It's creating massive uh, economic problems. Um, but let's remember the following. When the United States goes into war, and we can just remember Iraq in 2003 or Iraq in 1991, or Yugoslavia, for that matter, Serbia in 1999, its first targets, and that's within the first two weeks, are the the power grid. Uh, Baghdad was plunged into darkness, which is why most people who remember the first days and weeks of the Iraq war in 2003 will remember the, the ghostly green images um, caught through the uh, light-sensitive cameras of CNN and other channels. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is the standard practice of uh, of denying uh, and destroying the opponent's ability to communicate and to move troops. And unfortunately, it's inevitable that uh, power systems are dual use. They're both civilian and military. The remarkable thing is that the Russians haven't completely disabled the Ukrainian military, um, the uh, Ukrainian um, uh, power grid, which they can certainly do. And it seems to be that they're nudging the Ukrainians towards negotiation. Negotiations. They also haven't touched the bridges over the Dnieper uh, River, which would really create huge problems for the Ukrainians in supplying their troops. Because remember, all of the Western supplies are being brought into Ukraine along the railways and then the roads and then moved across the country towards the east. So this seems to be a very cynical um, uh, policy towards uh, uh, moving Kiev towards the negotiating table, but it's certainly not working so far. Sahik Dilea, if we ever needed any kind of reminder that this is a conflict that could escalate and go in any direction, well, we certainly had one last week when a missile struck Poland, killing two people. It caused a lot of alarm in NATO capitals uh, because, of course, Poland is a member of NATO and there was talk of the uh, Article 5 of NATO being invoked, you know, the collective defense uh, doctrine that could trigger off a full scale. World War. Later, the United States, NATO, and Poland said the missile came from Ukrainian forces. But President Zelensky continued to insist the missile was Russian. Uh, uh, a deputy minister in the defense ministry in Ukraine did subsequently say, look, we've looked at this. There were dozens of missiles going in all directions. And yes, it is possible that this was a Ukrainian missile. But what does that tell us, uh, sir? Well, it tells us that uh, the world is uh, really on the edge right now uh, as far as the possibility of a nuclear showdown. Uh, because if we, uh, luckily in this particular case, it was very clear that the missile was coming from Ukraine and that it was not an intentional attack on the NATO member country from Russia. But there could be a situation where there is less clarity as to who is attacking whom, uh, 
uh, and what is the goals behind it. Uh, and in this particular situation, we may see a greater escalation that will be happening between Russia and the West. Nobody is interested in it. And Ukraine is certainly not interested in any greater escalation of this conflict to the showdown between major powers. But the longer this conflict goes, the more likely we are going to see the situation like this reappear, where we may see an, a possibility of a greater escalation. Klaus Laris, what are the risks of that happening? As Sergei tells us, there could be a possibility of greater escalation. I mean, if we look at this missile attack um, and that initial talk of NATO getting involved in this, we could have seen a much, much wider conflict. Absolutely. The uh, conflict, the war is gradually escalating, unfortunately. We see the insane situation at the power plant, uh, the nuclear power plant, which uh, we discussed. We saw that uh, accidental attack on Poland. Now Germany has uh, provided Poland with Patriot anti-missile defense system, which can reach Russian territory if the Ukrainians uh, uh, were, were going to fire them, were getting hold of them and fire them uh, against Russia. Russia. Uh, so gradually the um, uh, conflict is escalating. So of course it would be sensible to enter into negotiations to bring the war to an end. But both sides need to come up with sensible, uh, a sensible basis for negotiations. And as we all agreed, unfortunately right now that basis doesn't seem to be uh, uh, in, in existence. It doesn't seem to be there. Viktor Olovich, in a speech over the weekend at that conference that I was talking about, the defense conference that took place in Canada, the United States Defense Secretary, Lloyd Austin, he addressed that conference, um, and this is what he had to say. Let's listen to him. Russia isn't just waging a, waging a war of aggression. It's also deliberately attacking civilian targets and civilian infra infrastructure with no military purpose whatsoever. Now, these aren't just lapses. These aren't exceptions to the rules. These are atrocities. So back in February, when this conflict escalated, Victor, the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, said that the purpose of uh, Russia going into Ukraine was to uh, protect Russian-speaking Ukrainians in the east of the country and also to get rid of Nazis who were in Ukraine at that time. Um, how does all of that square with what Russia is doing right now, hitting civilian infrastructure, um, attacking those power plants, as, as I mentioned? Well, the U.S. Defense Secretary would know something about atrocities, something about carpet bombings in Vietnam, about my lie, about uh, shock and awe in uh, Iraq that my colleague uh, referred to several minutes ago. Uh, obviously, war is not a pretty thing. Uh, people are getting killed, uh, people are getting wounded, and uh, a lot of civilians are uh, becoming casualties. Uh, and that is, that is, as I said before, a tragedy. But we have to look at the um, at you know, we have to look at the situation realistically. This is not uh, a lesson in morals or ethics. This is a lesson in geopolitics. Mm -hmm. And the question is, is the Ukrainian side going to be able to negotiate without preconditions, mm -hmm. or is it going to continue uh, making conditions that are completely unacceptable to Russia? Mm -hmm. It is quite obvious that no Russian government uh, is going to accept uh, the return of Crimea to Ukraine. It is quite obvious that the Russian army will staunchly defend Crimea against any attempt by the Ukrainian army mm -hmm. to enter the peninsula or to uh, occupy any, uh, any part of it. It is also quite obvious that the Russian government feels that abandoning the Russian population of the parts of the Donetsk right. region that it controls and uh, the Lugansk region is that that is completely untenable from a domestic from the point of view of domestic politics right. that is not going to happen and so if the Ukrainian side uh, is not going to, um, to to level with reality on the ground with yeah. facts on the ground then this conflict will continue for a long long time and unfortunately, more people will get killed, both military uh, and civilians. Anton, for the answer, on both sides. 
Anton Fedyashin, uh, the New York Times is reporting that it has verified the authenticity of videos from uh, the conflict zone showing at least 11 Russian prisoners of war killed by Ukrainian forces. But there is a vigorous debate about what really happened here. The Ukrainians say, look, one of the Russian soldiers started firing at Ukrainian soldiers that were in the vicinity, and this is what happened. That video actually shows these Ukrainian, uh, the Russian soldiers rather, shot at very close range. They were on the ground. Um, what did you make of what happened there? Well, it's very difficult to judge us with all war crimes. Look, there have been war crimes committed on all sides of this war. I actually, as an historian, I don't know of a single war that hasn't uh, witnessed uh, war crimes. Uh, whether it's Bucha that needs to be fully uh, investigated or the execution of Russian soldiers, this case and also earlier uh, videos uh, that came out from Ukrainian soldiers themselves. Uh, there's going to be uh, uh, plenty of this. I think part of the problem right now with the uh, mainstream media is that there's this uh, weaponization of uh, the suffering of uh, civilians. Mm. Uh, the Russians are building their cases against uh, the Azov Battalion and what they've been doing in the Donbass over the past eight years instead of just simply uh, since February. The weaponization of war crimes mm. is unfortunately used by both sides uh, to affect people's emotions right. and to stiffen the resolve and to avoid any kind of diplomatic solution which is sold um, as, uh, you know, complacency. Um, it, it's absolutely counterproductive. Do all of these uh, events need to be investigated independently? Yeah. Absolutely but by credible international institutions. Okay. Sir Hekvidelia, we've only got well, less than a minute left, and I'm going to get your thoughts on what happened there. Well, it is clear that um, you've seen uh, both on the part of the Ukrainian soldiers and the part of the Russian soldiers, you've seen an attempt to follow the rules of law. The Russians were surrendering, Ukrainians were accepting the surrender. But then the Russian soldier came out and started shooting at the Ukrainian side. And this is the, the central point of contention here, what yeah. happened after that. Right. Whether the so Russian soldiers were killed as a result of the self-defense on the part of the Ukrainians, or they were killed in an arbitrary manner by the Ukrainians. Right. And that is something that needs to be investigated. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. Thank you to all of you for being with us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C.